Okay, if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you turn to the book of Romans? That was, by the way, Jason, the uh, best song I could choose if I chose, all right, for what I'm preaching on this morning. Romans chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, you need to pull it up on the app. I think I'm going to have the verses behind me, but uh, I'm also going to be doing the Bible study on Wednesday, so I'm going to be dealing with Romans chapter 1. Now, you know, I, I believe, of course, as a pastor and I believe as a, as a Christian, it's very important for us to study and to know the Word of God, to know the reason, all right, for the faith that lies within us. And if I was looking for books in the Bible that I need to study, that I need to know, I think Romans would be really right at the top of that list. And why study Romans, especially today? Because today, uh, in our world, the gospel is being tampered with. The gospel is being compromised, the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And in fact, even the gospel is being set aside by many churches to avoid offending people. In other words, I don't want to confront people with the fact that you're a sinner, all right? And apart from the grace of God that we just sung about, that there is no hope for you. Came across a, a survey, the latest one I could find, it says that a majority of Christian groups, Christian groups, say that many religions can lead to eternal life, as many as 70% of them. 68% in the survey says uh, more, there is more than one way to interpret the Bible. In other words, you can't be too literal, right? In other words, everybody has their own interpretation. Everybody, you know, looks at it in a different way. So 68% of those that claim to be believers, Christians, they believe there's more than one way to interpret the Bible. 56% of mainline Christian groups say that we need to adjust and adopt our beliefs and practices to the culture around us. All right? In other words, we got to understand this is the culture. Things have changed. So we got to adapt. And we need to change beliefs. We need to change our right practices. But problem with this, this is not what the Bible teaches. All right? The Bible tells us that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. And when it talks about the faith, we're talking about the truth, all right, of the Word of God. In fact, the Bible is pretty clear that we are not to tamper in any slightest way with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we do that, all right, uh, literally we despise God's Word and we put in jeopardy the eternal destiny of souls around us. So that means, you know, if, if it's that important, then it demands that I have a clear understanding of what the gospel message is. Why are we meeting here this morning? We sung about, you know, grace. We sung about hope. We sung about life. What exactly is the gospel message? All right. What does the word of God tell us about this message? That's the reason we need to know Romans. The book of Romans is the most complete and plain statement of the gospel in the New Testament. If you want to know what the message of Christianity is, if you want to know what the gospel is, you need to read and study, all right, the book of Romans. Uh, Romans has been called the Christian Manifesto, a proclamation, we just got done singing about this, of freedom in Jesus Christ. That's what Romans is all about. And the overall message of the book of Romans is that all human beings... Every one of us, doesn't matter what race we're from, background, um, it doesn't matter how we are different from one another, all human beings are born in slavery to sin. But Jesus Christ came to set us free. And we just got done singing, free, free, free. Free from what? Freedom from the wrath of God, freedom from the condemnation of God's law, which in our flesh we cannot keep, and freedom from death that I do not need to fear death. For I understand that through Jesus Christ that he conquered death and it is no longer, all right, my enemy. Now, the letter was a, a mixed community. And I mean by that, there was Jewish people in the church and there was Gentiles in the church, all right? They came from totally different backgrounds, all right? They were raised in totally different ways. Due to this, there were many conflicts, all right, not only about worship, but about beliefs, because the Jews, all right, held, all right, to the Old Covenant, all right, 
uh, they held to trying to keep the law. And then you had the Gentiles who were hearing the message of grace in Jesus Christ. So what Paul is trying to do, he's going to try to weave two themes together, all right, in the book of Romans that the Jews would understand and the Gentiles would understand, all right? And the first, all right, he wants to make very clear is the justification of sinners, that we are justified in the sight of God. We are declared as if we have never sinned by grace alone, all right, in Christ alone, through faith alone. It's grace alone. It's nothing you have done. It's nothing I have done, all right? And it is Christ alone. You cannot separate Christ from the gospel or from our salvation and it is through faith alone that you put your faith and trust in him. And you look in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Notice what Paul says about this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of, what's the next word? Of Christ. You can't separate the gospel from who? From Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, also for the Greek, Gentile or Jew. Only one way, all right, of salvation, only one way to God, and that is through the gospel. For in it, the righteousness is revealed, not by keeping of the law, but is revealed by what? From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall what? Live by faith. So again, you're going to find that theme, all right, again, salvation through Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone. The second theme you're going to find throughout the book of Romans he redefines who the people of God are. Now understand that in that church, if I was a Jew, all right, and I could trace my lineage back to Abraham, I have to be a part of the people of God. Why? Because I could trace my lineage back to Abraham. In other words, because I was of the family of Abraham, therefore I am born into the family of God. So, uh, but it's no longer going to be that way, Paul says. It's not going to be according to who is your ancestor. It's not going to be according to your culture. It's not going to be according to whether you've been circumcised or not. But it is going to be according to faith in Jesus Christ. And all believers, all believers are the true children of Abraham regardless, all right, of their ethnic origin if they have the faith of Abraham. And you read about this in Romans chapter 4, verse 13 to 16. Listen to what he says. For the promise that or is seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What he's saying is that Abraham never appeared before God blameless because he lived a perfect life. If you know anything about Abraham, he did not live a perfect life. All right? He says it's not by that, but it's through the righteousness of what? Faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. Now, what's the law, all the law does is condemn us. Am I right? I mean, who here is going to say, you know what? Never broke any of the commandments. All right? I, 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 I've never, in other words, not done what God expects. We've all broken the law. And he's saying, if it's going to be that I'm a child of God because I've kept the law, we're all in trouble. All right? He says it's going to be totally, all right, by faith. So the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law or Jews, but to those also who are of the faith of Abraham, who was the father of us all. So therefore, a child of God is not just a Jewish person who has put their faith in Christ, but I am a Gentile, all right? I'm not Jewish, and most of us here, we are not Jewish, all right? But we also are children of God, and it's not through the law who I, uh, my parents were, or my great-grandparents, or my culture, but I am a child of God because of what? Jesus Christ, because of the gospel, all right? Now, the church in every generation has acknowledged the importance, all right, of Romans. In fact, um, I, I looked up a couple, you know, quotes that I have concerning this, that um, the epistle to uh, uh, Paul the Romans has been a force, you know, behind most of the significant conversions in church history. St. Augustine, the most brilliant th theologian. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. You know what, John? If there is another pulpit, I do not want to break this, all right? 
All right, St. Augustine, who was the most brilliant theologian in the early centuries, came to the conviction of sin and salvation after he read the 13th chapter of Romans. Martin Luther, all right, we think of Martin Luther with the Reformation. You understand how faith was ignited in his life, that the Reformation began. It began when he was reading and studying what book in the Bible? The book of Romans, where he realized that the gospel all right, was by faith. How many of, of us heard of John Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress? All right? You understand it was while in prison that he was reading and studying Romans, all right, that ignited the passion that he wrote what we know, all right, as Pilgrim's Progress. Also, John Calvin declared, if we are, all right, to gain a true understanding of Romans and to have an, uh, we have to understand Romans to gain an open door to all the profound treasures of Scripture. So William Tyndale, who was the father of the English translation, uh, uh, again, that he called Romans the light to all Scripture to the believer. If you're going to understand Scripture, you have to understand what? You have to understand, all right, Romans. F.F. F. Bruce says, there is no saying why it might happen if people begin to study the book of Romans. So my challenge this morning is going to be, you need to understand the book of Romans. Because I want to know the hope that lies within me. I don't want to have a pastor or somebody else explain to me, this is why you have hope. I want to know the reason that I have hope. And I want to know, all right, the message that I put my faith in that gives me that hope. So what I want to do this morning, I'm going to look at the first 18 verses, all right, chapter 1. And I'm going to look at six fundamental truths that Paul gives concerning the gospel. And then his attitude uh, towards the gospel. And I'll look at the rest of the chapter uh, on Wednesday. So again, if you're in Romans, Romans 1, verse 1, all right, the 6, we'll look at first six fundamental truths of the gospel or the message, all right, of the gospel that we believe is true and why we are here. But before we do that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless this morning as your word goes forth. I ask, dear Lord, that you would just illumine our minds, that we would understand your truth. And I pray, dear Lord, if there's anyone here who has not put their faith and trust in you, dear Lord, that you would reveal to them, dear Lord, your truth. Dear Lord, that you would reveal to them yourself. Dear Lord, and uh, I pray that you would reveal to them the way, dear Lord, to you, and that they would put their faith and trust in you this morning. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask something I said I would never do. Would you turn those two fans on me? You tell Matt he can be proud of me. All right? <laughs> Matt, when he preaches, he has all three fans going on. I can understand why. It's starting to get warm up here, all right? Let me give you six truths about the gospel. This is what we need to understand because we sung about the gospel, the freedom that we have. So I want you to understand these truths. All right? Number one, look, all right, in the book of Romans, chapter one. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of Paul. Is that what that says? He it says it's separated to the gospel of who? The gospel of God. You need to understand the origin of the gospel. Who invented this message? Did Paul sit down one day and say, you know, we need to come up and, uh, you know, start a new movement. And we need to have a message, something that people can believe in, something that, that, that people, you know, words will be committed to. And so he came up with the gospel message, and he preached it uh, around the world. And, you know, it took hold, and we have the church today. Is that what happened? No. It says the gospel was of God. It was revealed, and it was entrusted to Paul and the others by God himself. And this truth really is the, underlies all evangelism. This is why we take the message to others, because it's not something that was uh, came forth from man, but this is the message of Almighty God. It, what we have to share with people is not of human speculation. Well, this, this might be, this could be. Uh, it literally is truth, all right? Um, it, uh, it's more than just adding one religion to the pile. It's unlike what Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, uh, Jehovah Witness, Christian Science, uh, Mormonism, and all the others. Because what we are sharing, all right, that truth is not about man trying to make himself acceptable to God. Somehow, you know, I'm going to impress God to make myself worthy that he would accept me, all right? But the message is, is that God is reaching down to me, all right? 
uh, through the gospel, reaching down to me and good news for a dying world that I can have a relationship with God, not through keeping the law perfect, but through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. So very important to understand the gospel is of God. This is the message we're sharing. It's not my message. It's not any leader's message. This is the message of God. It's the gospel of God. So that's the origin of the gospel. How about the person of the gospel? Look, if you would, at verse 3. He talks about, all right, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. And then it mentions in verse 3 about this gospel, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, the person of, gospel, of the gospel is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You cannot separate the gospel from Jesus Christ. See, you have a lot of people that, that you know, that name offends them. And they want to try to remove that name, all right, from the Christian message. But you cannot. Because the gospel of God concerns God's Son, Jesus Christ. He is at the center of the gospel. In fact, if you go down to verse 9, all right, what Paul says here, he says, For God is my witness who I serve with the Spirit in the gospel of his who? Son. The gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. It's God's good news to man, what we preach and what we teach, is all about who? It's all about Jesus. It's not about any of us. It is all about him and who he is. And in this chapter, in the beginning, he mentions both to the Jew and Gentile who he is. Because in verse 3, you'll notice what he says. He says, concerning the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of who? Of the seed of David, all right? So literally, it's speaking about his humanity. In fact, in the New Testament, it calls Jesus the second Adam. In other words, Jesus came and was born through human lineage and had a human body, all right, like you and I, all right? This is what we celebrate at Christmas, that the eternal Son of God came to this world, took upon himself a form of man. And this is what Paul is saying. Jesus, all right, the of David, in other words, he speaks of his humanity, but also in verse 4, notice what he says. He says, and declared to be the son of who? Son of God. So he's the son of David, but also he's the son of God. And when he says he's the son of God, he's speaking of his deity. And his deity was verified by his what? What do we celebrate on Easter? The resurrection. Through the resurrection is confirmed that Jesus Christ was not merely man, but he was God and he was Lord. And he is God's perfect sacrifice for sins. And so if we even take one step away from Christ, who he is, we literally withdraw ourselves from the gospel. So we need to understand the gospel is all about Jesus. All right? It's all about him. He is the one through which and whom we have hope. So we see the origin of the gospel. It's God's message to us. The person of the gospel is Jesus Christ. But the witness to the gospel Notice what he says in verse 2. Which he promised before through the prophets of the Holy Scripture. See, people would say, well, wait a minute. Maybe it was just Paul or, you know, Peter and the other apostles. They're the only ones that really are giving forth the witness, all right, of the gospel and what we're hearing. Is there any other witnesses to the truth of the gospel which we put our hope on? And he mentions in verse 2... It was witnessed not only by the apostles, but it was witnessed by who? The Old Testament prophets. If you study the Old Testament, literally the entire Old Te Testament witnessed that Jesus Christ was going to come to this earth and he was going to make the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 24. Many of you might remember this passage. Remember Jesus when he was resurrected. Um, and it was uh, days after, and he was walking uh, uh, down the road, and two disciples on the way to Emmaus, Jesus appeared to them, to them, all right? And uh, they're talking, and they were kind of upset that Jesus had died on the cross, all right? All their hopes and aspirations were 
crushed. They didn't recognize who Jesus was. And if you look at verse 25, 27, Jesus ended up saying to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. He says, you don't understand what you've been reading. You don't understand the Old Testament, the prophets, what the scriptures say, all right, concerning me. He says, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, what he did with these two men, he had a Bible study. All right, he took them back, all right, and he showed them where the Old Testament proclaimed him. And I'll give you a couple scriptures like that. You might not be able to turn as I go, but Daniel chapter 7, all right, mentions about the Son of Man, 13 and 14. Jesus probably ended up uh, quoting this passage to them. This is Daniel speaking. I was watching in the night watches, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. He had to explain to those men, who is this son of man? Who is this one that is coming and is going to rule and reign? It was none other than the one that was what? With them. He had to explain that to them. Also, he probably explained in Daniel chapter 4, a story that, Jan Daniel chapter 3, a story that all of us know. Remember the three Hebrew boys that were thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't worship Nebuchadnezzar? All right? All right, the Jews, the two apostles, they understood that story, but they didn't catch what was really happening there because in verse 25, all right, in Daniel 3, that when Nebuchadnezzar looked in that furnace, he said, I see four men loose walking into the fire, and they're not hurt. He said, wait a minute, I threw three in, but now I see four. And this, these are, this is the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He says, and the fourth was like the son of God. All right? He had to explain to those men, guess who that was in the fiery furnace? All right, and explained it was none other than the one that was with you at this time. Also, Isaiah chapter 53, that speaks of the suffering uh, servant. All right, and again, verses that we're familiar with. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, and we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He had to explain to those two disciples who were with him, all right, for most of his ministry, that this one that Isaiah was speaking about that would be wounded, all right, be beaten and bruised for their iniquities was Jesus Christ the one who they spent all that time with, the one who was with them now. So again, he explained to those men that the Old Testament Scripture has been speaking and been witnessing of him. See, the gospel is not only the witness of the apostles, but it's the witness of the Old Testament. That's why Paul is writing here in Romans, many of them Jewish, that telling them that your Scriptures speak of the Lord Jesus Christ who was at the center of the gospel message. But then he goes on the scope of salvation. You know, who's this salvation, you know, available to? Look at verse 5 of Romans chapter 1. What does he say? In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. And it says there, among how many nations? All nations. You see, you realize when the gospel message was first proclaimed, there was no such thing as the United States of America. Am I right? But yet, it is saying that the gospel is for all nations, for all people, all right? Uh, in verse 16, 
it says it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And so Paul was affirming the gospel is for everybody. It's not just for certain people in a certain, you know, uh, ancestry. It's not for certain people in a certain social, you know, environment. He's saying the gospel is for everyone who will admit before God that they are sinners separated from God by their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so the cause of the gospel really is that we are to be liberated from our pride, whether race, nation, nationality, tribe, class, and acknowledge the gospel is for everyone. See, this is true. What that means is there is no one, no one that is going to go to heaven, go into the presence of God, that does not get there by the way of the cross and by way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what he's saying? He's saying it is only through the gospel. He said, well, I, I don't like that. I don't believe. Well, whether we like it or not, all right, that is the truth. That's what Paul's saying the gospel message is. It is to everyone who believes. Now, there's a certain result of the gospel. Not everybody, you know, that goes to church is necessarily a Christian. Am I right? All right? I, I, I was a pastor for a lot of years. I used to kid people. I'd say, I've known people in my life as a pastor, some of those ungodly people, but they'd be in church every Sunday, right? I mean, the Lord knows. What is, what's the earmark, all right, or the characteristic of one who has put their faith and trust in the gospel? Notice what he says, all right, the result of the gospel is. Look again at verse 5. He says, through him we have received grace and apostleship. This is Paul writing, so he's saying, I've received grace through Jesus Christ. In other words, he forgave me. Remember, Paul, Paul was a murderer. Paul persecuted the church. But he got saved on the road to Damascus, and God extended him grace. And he extended him grace and salvation for what? What do the next words say? For obedience to the faith. I receive grace for obedience, all right, of faith. Or the obedience that comes from faith. What he is saying is that when one puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what follows is that there is obedience or submission, all right, to God. Kind of reminds you of Abraham, who was the father of the faithful, all right? It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed, all right, in Hebrews chapter 11, when he was called to go out to a place he would receive as inheritance, and he went not knowing where he was going. In other words, Abraham was justified by faith. All right, and he submitted himself and he obeyed God. God said, here's where I want you to go. Or basically he told him what direction, all right? And he probably Abraham said, well, how am I know when I get there? And he says, I'll let you know. In other words, you just step out day by day, moment by moment. And Abraham stepped out by faith in submission to God. His obedience was not by law that he, had, that he was obeying. And if I obey God, then I'm going to be right with God and be saved. He obeyed God, all right, because of his faith in God, all right, because of his relationship to God. See, a true living faith in Jesus Christ has the element of submission and obedience to the Lordship of Christ. See, uh, how am I going to say I truly know God, I've truly experienced his grace, and yet I will not submit myself to God at all? There's something contrary is what he's saying. I, I, I like the quote by A.W. Tozer, who says, The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience, and it does not recognize any obedience that does not spring forth from faith. So he says the natural outcome of our faith is that we want to put ourselves submission, submissive to God. And the response Paul looked for in believers, true believers, is total commitment to who? Total commitment to God. See, our commitment when we come is not to a church. Our commitment is to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, through whom we obtain grace. And we are to, we are to believe, but from that saving faith comes submission. You know, we need to ask ourselves, in other words, does my life show this submission? Now, the goal of the gospel, what is the gospel for? You know, sometimes you would talk to people and they well, in other words, I'm saved and therefore I'm going to what? Heaven when I die. 
But is, is that really the end of the gospel? It, it, he says, through him we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations. For what? For his name. In other words, why did Paul desire to bring all nations to the obedience of the faith? It was for the glory and honor of who? Of his God and his son, Jesus Christ. That's why you read in Philippians 2, 9 and 10. God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above all names that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those in earth and those in under the earth. See, our zeal in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ is that his name be lifted up. I, I would always say that. I know it's bad. Nobody needs to know who I am. They need to know who he is. The gospel is all about lifting up his name. He will grow his church. And Paul is imploring these people and telling them, all right, what the gospel, all right, truly is. And then he reveals in verse 14 to 17, because of the gospel, how it changed his life, how it changed the apostle Paul's outlook on life, all right? Uh, and, and, and the big thing of the apostle was evangelism, all right? He was telling other people about who? About Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, people today kind of regard evangelism, sharing the gospel as Sort of like an extra. In other words, Jason, you were hitting this on Wednesday night. You were talking in First Thessalonians chapter 1 of how all of us, all right, are to share the gospel. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we have an obligation to share that good news. It, it doesn't belong to a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or an evangelist. All of us are to share that good news as God gives us opportunity. But the attitude of many people is reluctance, all right, a fear. And but Paul's heart toward sharing the good news of the gospel, he, man, he was eager. He was enthusiastic. Now think about this. Paul's background was he persecuted the church. He had members of people's families killed. Now you think of this, and you're going to have this guy now going to come witness to you. I'm going to witness to you, Leanne, all right, about Jesus Christ, but I had your husband killed and maybe your children. Wouldn't you think there'd be any reluctance on his I mean, part? How is she going to accept this message coming from me? But Paul, it didn't matter. Because God extended grace to him. He was eager to share the message of the gospel. And three things, you know, when I, I look at the Apostle Paul, what stirred his heart? Number one, and these should be true of all of us, all right? He had a sense of obligation. A sense of obligation. Look at verse 14 of chapter 1. What does he say? I am a debtor to the Greeks, barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Paul said, I have a sense of obligation. I am indebted to live the gospel and share the gospel. Now, two ways to get in debt. Am I right? All right. Number one, I could go to Rob and say, Rob, uh, I need $10,000. All right. And Rob gives me $10,000 and I can make monthly payments to Rob. All right. I'm in debt to Rob. But now Rob could do something else. Rob could say, Pastor Bill, I'm going to give you $10,000 that you would give to Pastor Matt to help in a certain ministry. Now, I am indebted to Rob, all right, that I would use that money to what? To give to Pastor Matt or to help in whatever ministries there are. So I can borrow money, money from somebody to be in debt or I'm given money from someone by a third party, and I'm put in debt and trust, being entrusted all right, with that money. Now, in this sense, Paul sees himself indebted all right, to the Romans and everyone because Paul, God entrusted the gospel to him. He tasted of the grace of God. He was saved. He knew he was going to heaven, and God entrusted him with that treasure, and he was in debt to share the gospel with the other people. What would you call me, Rob, if you gave me $10,000 and I didn't, all right, for Matt, and I didn't give it to Matt, you would call me a? <laughs> a scam artist, thief, or whatever, right? You wouldn't think too highly of me. The same way, how can I be right with God if he has shared his gospel, the most precious thing in my life, and I won't, I'm going to keep it to And so this is how Paul saw it. 
And similarly, we are debtors. If the gospel has come to us, we have no liberty to keep it to ourselves. Good news is for sharing. I'm under an obligation to let it be known to others. I know as a pastor, I used to have people, they'd be in the hospital and so forth, doctor's office, and they would talk about these moments that God would open up these opportunities that they were able to share their faith. How were you able to go through this experience? How were you able to still have faith? How were you able to still have a smile? And they share the gospel. Can I say this? What, I, I was at a funeral just well, a couple, what was it, two or three uh, weeks ago, all right? Jerry Sneed passed away. And uh, there was two of his guys that were in his, cla- in his uh, dorm room that he went to college. Now, think of this. I think Jerry was 56, 58 years of age. Two guys that were in his dorm room in college for three years, and they stood up to witness. It was through Jerry that they came to know the Lord. So what I'm saying is you don't get behind a pulpit and we're preaching the gospel. I mean, that's wonderful, right? But it's, it can be a guy in the dorm. It can be somebody in the doctor's office next to you. It can be somebody in the hospital bed when you're at. You don't know where it is, but God will open up opportunities. And Paul says, I'm in debt to do that, all right? And we are in debt to do it. So Paul saw himself, all right, in debt to share the gospel. Also, he had a sense of conviction. Because in verse 16 and 17, I've already read these verses, he says the gospel is the power of God under salvation. Do you believe that's true? Is it power? I mean, it's just like, it's a simple message. If you, want, if you knew somebody was dying of COVID, all right? I mean, and you had the absolute, guaranteed, 100% cure, and you didn't share with them. But what type of person would that be, Right? And I'm saying, do you believe absolutely that there was life through Jesus Christ? You believe that the only eternal hope you have is through the gospel? Then literally, if I believe that, all right, I need to share that, but follow me. The devil understands that. What's he going to do? He's going to make us ashamed of the gospel, try to keep us quiet, isn't he? Because he understands there's power in the gospel. So he doesn't want us to share the gospel. That's why throughout the New Testament you constantly find Jesus and Paul and others telling the people, don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed. Um, In Mark, I think it's chapter 8, Jesus said this, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed. In other words, and Paul told us to Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel. See, tell me, we all face this, don't we? We get in situations, and instead of sharing our faith, what do we do? We back away. What are they going to think of me? In other words, I, I, I don't have all the answers. In other words, I, I better not say anything. We're ashamed of him. And Paul says we need to be convicted, all right, that the, that the gospel is the power of God to salvation and share. And how do you overcome that temptation? is remembering that the message that some people, some people will reject you, sure. But it's the power of salvation to everyone who believes. You don't know who's going to believe, do you? Nobody knows. So you share the message. But Paul also had a sense, all right, of affection. Not only did he say, I'm in debt, not only did he believe the gospel is the power of God of salvation, but Paul loved his Savior. Because in verse 1 he says, how does he describe himself? Paul, a what? Bond servant of Jesus Christ. You know what a bond servant was, right? If a person sold himself into slavery, all right, to work for a master because of debt, and he, and he worked for his master for X number of years, and during that time, say he took a wife and he had children, all right? The time came when that man was going to be able to go out free. But the wife and children, all right, the master who had given them to him, they were going to remain all right there. And so the man, because of his love for the master, how he's treated him, he would go to the master and say, in other words, I want to bind myself to you for all time. I want to become your bond servant. And they would take him to the door, and they would use an awl, and they would make the imprint on his ear, and he was a bond servant indentured to that master for life. What Paul was saying, I was going my own way, heading to an eternity separated from God. And God reached out and saved me, and everything good in my life is from him. And he says, I see myself as a bond servant. 
In other words, literally, I'm indentured. I'm marked by God. I want to serve him, all right? And uh, it wasn't out of duty, but it was out of love for what God did for him. Came across this illustration of a missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. And someone had asked him, he has a tremendous ministry, open up China, all right? Somebody suggested he has given his life to the Orient because he loved the Chinese people so much. As it's not because I love the Chinese that I gave my life. It's because I love God. See, that was Paul. God, in the midst of his deep sin, reached out to him by his grace. And it was literally Paul saying, how can I not love him? And a sense of affection that he gave his life towards him. You know, the question when you study the book of Romans, there's two questions I wrote down here. Number one, I always had to ask myself, have I responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ? In other words, I've already responded to the gospel. In other words, I'm not trying, I don't go to church in order to make myself, you know, look good or feel good or make myself presentable to God, all right? But I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. He died for my sins. He is my hope, and I come here to worship him because of the grace that he showed towards me. Have you accepted Jesus Christ? You know, because of Heights and I was preaching, there was a lady in the church that attended that church what, by Fitch, what, 20, 25 years. And all of a sudden, she's coming down the aisle to get saved. Oh, what in the world? Wait, she's 25 years. I thought maybe she misunderstood me. No. She attended all it, but never personally except Jesus Christ. See, going through church doesn't get your brownie points. I remember when I was in the Catholic church, there was a thing that if you went to communion on the first Sunday of every month for 12 months, then I was guaranteed that, you know, I'd be going to heaven. Well, guess what? God doesn't operate that way. It's not like a card you get punched, all right? It's like my faith has to be in him. So have I accepted Christ as my Savior? The second question I have to ask myself, all right, am I sharing the good news? Am I sharing the good news? I was kidding around with a brother with a Charlie Brown Snoopy shirt, all right? I love, I, I love Snoopy, all right? Charlie Brown, Peanuts cartoons. Linus, throwing a stick, all right, for Snoopy to retrieve. All right? First instinct of Snoopy is the what? Run after the stick, right? But he pauses, all right, in the cartoon for a few minutes and decides I'm not doing this. And the caption reads this. I want the people to have more to say about me after I'm gone than he was a nice guy and he chased sticks. He played golf or, you know, he did this, he did that. Man, is, is that what life's about, that we're chasing different sticks, thinking it's going to make us happy? Or am I sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? And am I going to have the blessing that one day when we find ourselves in eternity, people are going to come up to me, thank you for sharing the gospel with me. Thank you. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around for a second. I don't want to take anything for granted this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Can I say this morning, it is by grace and grace alone. If you're here this morning, you understand that you are a sinner and that your sin has separated you from a holy God and that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth that he would die on the cross to pay the penalty, the price for our sin. And if you would put your faith and trust in him, Paul says we pass from death unto life. We sung about that. We're freed from the condemnation of sin. If we, you say that sounds simple. Well, I'm glad it's simple. As a 16-year-old boy, I remember walking down the aisle of a Christian movie theater when God convicted me that I was a sinner, separated from God, and I wasn't ready to meet God. Maybe this morning you need to right where you're at, to bow and pray and ask him into your heart, accept him as your Savior. Maybe this morning, there's people that you know that are close to you, that you love, and you've never shared the gospel to them. Do you understand and do you believe that if they die, whether COVID or anything else, they're heading out to a Christless eternity? And how could I say I love them or even care about them if I don't share the gospel? Is my fear of man that great 
that it cancels out the love I have for my God. Maybe you need to make a commitment that as God gives you opportunity, you're going to share the gospel. It's not your responsibility what they do with it, but out of love and compassion that you would share with them. See, you sow the seed. You're not going to get anybody saved. God does that. But maybe you can't even remember the last time you told anybody about him. We're going to ask that everyone stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Maybe this morning, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you want to come to this altar and just thank him this morning. Commit yourself to him. Maybe this morning you need to come and to pray for people you know that you haven't shared, that God would give you the opportunity and give you the courage that you would share the gospel. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Maybe you just need to thank him that, if you're like me, that, that he would even reach out by his grace to save you. Dear Heavenly Father, have your way and will this morning, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.